Well, good morning, Powerhouse. Good morning. I'm super excited that you could choose to come to join us this morning. Powerhouse is at church where we believe that God is good. That God is so good, even when the circumstances are dark. That God is good. God is constantly, will always be a good God. We are a church in one church in two locations. We meet here every Sunday at our uh, Wyckoff campus. We also meet in Bridgewater, who are right now joining us via live stream. Wyckoff, would you welcome Bridgewater, who are joining us via live stream? Amen. This morning, we continue with our series in the book of Daniel, the Untouchable series. Each of us, at one time or another, has asked the question, why am I here? What's the meaning of life? What's my purpose? That's a question that I think we all ask at one time or another, isn't it? Sometimes every day. These questions of meaning of life and purpose may arise at any time in our lives. In fact, sometimes we ask, is life just about going to work, earn some money, and pay bills so that you can buy some food and go to work and earn some money and pay bills and buy food? Is, is that what life is all about? I think life is more than that. There's more to life than just the dailies of working and paying bills. The questions of meaning our purpose are usually more prevalent during the times of transition, times of personal loss, times of illness, times that someone has called life's shipwrecks. When, when things are tough, I think the questions of meaning of life uh, become more uh, prevalent in our lives. I remember when my family moved here from Kenya four years ago to start serving here at church. It was a, a choice we made, but we went through some traumatic experiences. Just being in a new place is difficult. And I found my family asking that question, why did we leave our comfortable home and come to this cold place. I mean, today is a beautiful day. Today just feels like Africa. Someone say amen. I mean, it's just incredible. But why did we do this? I remember the, that first school day when my children uh, were going when the bus pulled by the house and they were walking to the bus and I, I, the, the ground was full of snow and they were shivering and they were asking, Dad, do we have to go to school? Do we really have to go to school? Is that why we came here? I'm sure you ask that question. Why am I here? Especially when you've been hit by a difficult situation like an illness. You got that diagnosis from a doctor and told you that it's not good news. Or you received that phone call from your spouse and said, hey, I think we should think about parting, out, parting ways. Or you got that letter on your desk telling you that this is your last day at this place. When we go through stuff like that, the question of purpose becomes more real and compulsory. But I want to say that everyone who's been created by God, and that is everyone, has a purpose. Each of you, each of us, has a God-given purpose. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 2 verse 10. He says, we, we, that's you and I, we are God's workmanship. We are God's handiwork. We've been fashioned by God. We are created in Christ Jesus 
for a purpose, to do good works that God himself designed and prepared for us. That God has fashioned you, has built you, has shaped you for a very important purpose. You're here for a reason. You're here for more than just paying bills. So in this message today from the book of Daniel, chapter 2, we're going to seek to find how we can discover our life's purpose, especially in crisis. We're going to ask Daniel to share with us some of the insights that he has learned through experience of how he himself discovered his life purpose, especially when life was tough for him. The book of Daniel is, begins in 605 BC when King Nebuchadnezzar attacked Judah, the kingdom of Israel, and subdued it. And he destroyed the temple, he took the king, and also deported some of Israel's finest. Some of those included a man by the name Daniel. At that time, he was only maybe 15, 16, just but a teenager. And he was deported to Babylon with his three friends. They were recruited, when they arrived in Babylon, they were recruited to serve King Nebuchadnezzar. We are told that upon recruitment, they were enrolled at the University of Babylon where they, they studied literature and language, you know, so that they could not only understand how the culture works, but the Babylonians wanted to transform them to be like Babylonians, to, to worship the gods of Babylon. And so they enrolled them to understand the language and culture of Babylon. They not only took them to, to school to, to study the culture of Babylon, but also they decided to change their names, like just give them new identities, identities that are in line with the gods of Babylon. So Daniel, whose Jewish name meant God is my judge. Daniel means God is my judge. His name was changed to Belshazzar, which means Bel protects, Bel will protect my life. Bel was the god of like the chief god of the Babylonians, called also, also known as Maduk. So instead of being called by the name of the god of heaven, they change his name to be in line with the god of the Babylonians. Like, Daniel, you're different now. You're in a different culture. We want you right now to worship the gods of this culture, okay? We want you to fit in. If you're going to serve the king, if you're going to, to serve the purposes or to, to, to find your purpose in this, in this culture, you have to not only learn our, our literature, but you have to worship the gods of this culture. Hananiah, who was one of Daniel's friends, Hananiah means God is grace. His name was changed to Shadrach. Shadrach means under the command of Aku, Aku was the moon god of the Babylonians. So like, your name changes from God is grace to now you're under the command of Aku. You're under the command of the moon god. You need to know that, Shadrach. So we are going to, we're going to call you from Hananiah, we'll call you Shadrach. Mishael, Mishael, one of uh, Daniel's other friends, his name, his name, the Jewish name Mishael means who is like God. Like, who is like this untouchable God? Who is like the great God of Israel who created the heavens and earth? So every time Mishael's name was, was mentioned in Babylon, they, they were threatened by it. So they said, Mishael, we're going to change your name. <coughs> Sorry. And your name is going to be 
who is like Aku, who is like the moon god. Daniel's other friend, Azariah, Azariah, the name means the Lord helps. In other words, God is involved in our lives. The Lord helps. The Babylonians say, no, we're going to change your name to Abednego, which means the servant of Nebo, or the servant of the God of Babylon. Every secular culture will intentionally strive to give you an identity according to the gods of that culture. Every secular culture is going to give you an identity because the God of heaven seems to be very uncomfortable. We don't want to mention his name. We don't want to talk about Jesus in our school. It's so uncomfortable. I mean, we can talk about all the other gods, but don't talk about who? Jesus. Don't talk about Daniel, and don't talk about Mishael, and don't talk about Azariah, and don't talk about Hananiah. We, we are comfortable with Belshazzar. We are comfortable with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We are comfortable with them. So they try to change these four teenagers. They were even tempted with food. But we read last week that Daniel resolved to not defile himself. In other words, he made a decision that regardless of what my culture will throw at me, I will remain a worshiper of the God that I know. I will remain a worshiper of Jesus, regardless of what happens. See, if we're going to find our life's purpose in God, we need to make that decision that we are going to be followers of Jesus, regardless of what the culture will throw at us. That we will resolve that the untouchable God is going to be our God. So today we look at Daniel chapter 2 and we ask the question, what is exactly are the things that Daniel did? Chapter 2 starts with a crisis. Chapter 2 verse 1, we are told in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Dreams, the Babylonians believed that dreams was the ways that the gods communicated important messages to the kings of those days. And so if you had a dream, you took that very seriously. So King Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream, so he's taking this very seriously. We are told that his mind was troubled. The kingdom is, is troubled. And the king could not sleep. There, is, there was insomnia in the palace, like life was hard. So the king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came and stood before him, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. I, the reason I hired you guys is that you give me advice and counsel during such times. Verse 4, the astro then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. Tell us the dream, tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it like king uh, tell us the dream. If you just tell us the dream, we'll, we'll be able to figure it out. Because that's what usually happens. If the king had a dream or someone had a dream, they'll tell you, hey, this was my dream. I dreamt such and such and such. And the wise man would try and figure it out. But this particular time, it was different. Verse 5, the king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of, of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Like, look, 
I won't even tell you the dream. We don't know whether the king had forgotten the dream or he didn't want a political interpretation. Because sometimes what some of these guys did, they would try and figure out what is it that will make the king happy. And that's what they would say. The king decided, I'm not telling the dream. You guys need to tell me my dream and interpret it. I'm like, king, come on. That's impossible. Verse 7. Let the king tell his servants a dream and we will interpret it. The king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, that it, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping that the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream and I will know what how, that you can interpret it for me. Verse 10, they say, King, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No one. So the king, that's impossible. We can't. And they were right. There is no one on earth who can do that. They were not lying. They were being very honest. Like, this is impossible. Have you ever been in a situation, in a crisis situation, where every which way you look, there is no way out. It's an impossible crisis. And you're asking yourself, what is, the, what is my purpose in this situation? Why, why am I even alive? God, what's the reason? Why did you, if, if, if you knew that I was going to be in this situation, why did you even allow me to be alive today? I find myself asking questions about purpose, especially when things are very hard. When life is very difficult. When there are things going on in the family or, or something going on with the ministry or just in my life in general. I'm sure you find that also like, what's, what's, what's my purpose? So the king, verse 11, verse 12 of chapter 2. This made the king so angry and furious, and he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. At this time, Daniel and his four, his friends, these four boys, were now serving as wise men in Babylon. So that means that they were also facing execution. This was a life and death situation. It's a crisis. There is insomnia in the palace and a crisis in the nation. What do you do? I'm thinking of my brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico right now. With all the earthquakes, And the fear that is engulfing people's hearts. You don't know whether this building is safe. So you can't even be inside of it. What do you do? When you have little kids. And your house is destroyed. What do you do? Daniel and his friends were facing execution. Life situation. You ask more questions than, than just that, what is my purpose? You ask, where is God? Does he have a plan? Is he even thinking about us? I'm sure there are people this morning who are asking that question, where is God? Where is he when I, where was God? When the divorce started to unravel, 
Where was God when I received that, 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 that phone call from the doctor that, that the, the, mess, the, the news is not good? Where is God when I was fired from my job? Where is God when my young teenager was going crazy? Where is God and what do you want me to do at this time? Lord, what do I do with my life? What's the reason for living if this is what life serves me? Verse 14, we are told, when Ariok, the commander of the king's guard, had gone to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke with him, spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Ariok explained the matter to Daniel. At this Daniel went into the king, went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. What do you see here? Imagine the, the, the commander has come. He stepped at your door and he's knocked. He's come to take you, to take Daniel and kill them. Kill him and his friends. And you see Daniel pressing into the crisis with wisdom and tact. Number one, whenever we are in those kinds of situations, press into the crisis. Don't back away from it. Press into it. And you ask yourself, where did Daniel get the courage to press into the situation? Well, I told us last week that Daniel was a student of prophet Jeremiah. Daniel listened to Jeremiah's preaching. In Daniel chapter 9, you will see that Daniel was reading prophet Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, God had told the Israelites that when you, when you, when you go into exile, when you're in that dark place, I want you to know that I have a good plan for you. That even when it is dark, I, the God of Israel, I have a good plan for you. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That in the middle of this dark place, I want you to know that I have good plans for you. That there you should have hope that even when you're threatened with death, you still do have a future. Those promises, I believe, were welling in Daniel's heart. And he said, if God says that, there has to be a way. Let's press into this issue. Let's ask the questions. Let's gather all the information that we need to know. Let's find out whether there's a way out. Ask the questions. Ask the right people. Ask God for wisdom. James 1.5 says this, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously without finding fault. If any man lacks wisdom, if any woman lacks wisdom, in other words, if you don't know what to do, if you don't know how to figure this out, if you're looking for insight and discernment on how and when and who about this situation, ask God. And it says God gives wisdom generously, lavishly. And he will show you a way out. That's a powerful promise in the book of James that we should claim. So Daniel pressed into the situation, into the crisis with wisdom and tact, we are told. He found out how, when, who to talk to. He had the courage to go to the king. How about that? A 
17, maybe he was 18 years old at this time, he walked into the king's presence. You only do that when you know that you have an untouchable God who is in charge, who is the king of kings. You don't do such things when you don't believe there is a God who is stronger than your circumstance. But when you believe that there is a God who is stronger than your circumstance, then you can walk into and press into the circumstance. So Daniel goes into the king's presence. And he tells the king, could you give us more time? He didn't ask, he didn't tell the king, hey, you tell me the dream. Notice what he asked the king was different. He said, give me more time. Then we will interpret the dream. His was different from what the magicians had asked. Give us more time. Then verse 17, this is the second point. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel had friends. I don't know about you, but if you don't have friends in a time of crisis, life can be very tough. You need to have people who you can go and explain and open your heart to and say, guys, this is what we are facing. It is tough. I'm going to ask you, do you have friends? Two are better than one, Ecclesiastes says. Do you have people who you can talk to? I mean, like really talk to people who are safe? People who won't gossip. People who you can be vulnerable with. You know, life can be very lonely if you don't have people who you can call and say, hey, I just want to talk. Things are really hard right now, and I don't know what to do. Daniel goes and he talks to his friends and then look, this, so a crisis becomes lighter when we have a community of friends. So in the midst of a crisis, the community of friends, you can share it with them and it becomes lighter. Verse 18 says, he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. So it's like, guys, we don't know what is going on. What we know is that the king had a dream, and right now we are going to be killed. So what do we do about this? Other than just talking with my friends, he says, let's talk to God. Let's turn to God. Let's plead with God. Notice he uses the word plead. It's not even pray. It's plead. It's, it's a kind of prayer that comes from the depths of your stomach. It's a cry that sometimes you have no words that words cannot even capture. It's a groaning of the Holy Spirit that we are told in, 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 the, book of, uh, in the book of Romans that sometimes we don't even have words. We groan from the, from the depths of our stomach. Asking God, God, help. Sometimes the only prayer you have is God, help. Help me. Help us. Notice it says they pleaded for mercy. They understood, they understood this, being Israelites. They understood what is told us in, in Hebrews chapter 4. That God has a throne. That God is the king of kings. He is the untouchable. And his throne is called the throne of of grace, and that we can access that throne, and that we can ask God for mercy. Mercy is saying, God, withhold the judgment. Withhold this execution that is facing us. Lord, withhold this painful situation that is facing me in my family. Lord, put your hand against it and press it away from us. Lord, have mercy on us. 
Someone here needs to ask God, Lord, have mercy on me. Someone needs to pray this morning and say, Lord, I need your mercy. Just have mercy on, on me. I'm not even coming and say, I'm a good guy. You know, I did this, I did that. No, God, I'm just asking you, have mercy on me. I, I just need mercy. I need your help. I don't know what to do, where to turn, but I've heard of you that you are rich in mercy. You're a great God. Have mercy. So Daniel and his friends, they had mercy. They, they, they prayed and asked God for mercy. I wonder why they did this. Because they had a conviction. A conviction that there is a God in heaven. Notice it says they asked the God in heaven. In, in Babylon, there were all these other gods, but they were on earth. All right? The king himself thought he was God. So there are all these other powerful forces. The king himself was really powerful. The guy could kill you. So it's not that he was not, he did not have power. But they realized that there was someone else who has power over these other gods. And so we need to go to him. When Jesus was teaching prayer to his disciples, he told them to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, that your seat, O oh God, is far above the earth, that your throne is far above all these other gods, that you are above every circumstance, every situation, that Jesus, you've been given a name that is above every name, that, that Jesus, in your presence, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is God, that we will talk to that God who is in heaven, not any other God. We know that there are gods around here right now, but those gods will not do anything to us. So we go to God in heaven, our Father who art in heaven. I said that Daniel listened to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3. Jeremiah said this. God says, call unto me, and I will answer you. And I will show you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. That's God's cell phone number. Dial 333. Okay? Dial 333. You can do 911. 911 will bring the, the, fire, the fire and the, the first responders and all of those people, the police and everything. 333 will bring the angels and God. All right? So dial both. But I want, I want the angels and God to come in this situation because there are situations where the police and the fire people and the first responders are... are I love them greatly. They cannot sort it out. Because this is the kind that we need 333. Call unto me, God says. says, says Come on, dial that number. And he says, and I will do what? I will show you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Daniel, they did not know what the king had done. But God knew. So they said, we're going to ask God who knows everything. And he will show us. Do you believe that God will show you everything? Do you believe that God will show you things that you do not know? That even in situations where you don't know what to do, that you can ask God and he will give you insight and discernment into a situation. You'll ask, have you ever been in a situation where you ask, I, I, I did not think that thought. I've never thought that thought before. I don't have the ability to think that thought. That thought must have come from somewhere else. That thought must be from God. I don't have time to go into all the thing of discernment this morning. But God has promised, call unto me, and I will do what? I will answer you. Do you have that conviction? 
He answers even difficult prayers. Jeremiah 32, 17, and Jeremiah 32, 27. Let's look at Jeremiah 32, 17. The, Jeremiah said, Lord, you have, you are the God of heaven. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and, an, an, and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Even this situation is not hard for you. And then it's really powerful when God himself spoke to Jeremiah in verse 27 of Jeremiah 32 and said, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Is anything too hard for God? Is anything too hard for God? Is anything too hard for God? Is anything too hard for God, powerhouse? I don't know about that situation, but is it too hard for God? Is that circumstance too hard for God? The fires in Australia. The things that are facing our world right now. The poverty and the hunger in different parts of the world. Our own situation here at Powerhouse, we don't know where we're going to go at the end of the year. We're trying to find a place. We've seen some places. We don't know what's going to happen, but I believe that nothing is too hard for God. That God's going to open a door, and we're going to find a place because nothing is too hard for God. <laughs> you have to believe that. You see, if we, if we don't have that kind of belief, then we have no business even trying to come every Sunday morning. Like, what, what's the point? There's no point. Why would we be lying to ourselves? I want a God who is a God of the impossible. A God who parts the Red Sea. That's the kind of God I want. And so Daniel and his friends, they pray. They plead for mercy. And verse 19 I love verse 19 of chapter 2. We are told that during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Notice that it was not in a dream. It was in a vision. A dream is when you're asleep. A vision is God showing you pictures and downloading stuff in your heart. And you can see things clearly. There's a difference. So in the night, but even in darkness, huh, it's very powerful there. In the night, in darkness, in the darkness of Babylon, in the darkness of the circumstances, in the darkness of all these other gods, in the darkness of the situation, God shows and he opens the door and he says, Hey, Daniel, this is what the king is doing. And we see how Daniel expresses himself to God and his friends. Verse 20, he prays the name of the God of heaven. He calls him the God of heaven. He so, his conviction about God is so strong, he's the God of heaven. He says, wisdom and power are his. The God, you are the untouchable, verse 21. You change times and seasons. You dispose kings and you raise up others. You give wisdom to the wise and the knowledge to the discerning. You reveal deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells within him. You are the untouchable God. And I praise you this morning. That's what Daniel says. Verse 23, I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. For you have given me wisdom and power. And made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. So Daniel, he discovers at this moment, this is why God brought us to Babylon. Now we see the reason. There is a reason God brought us to Babylon. 
This is the reason God chose us and brought us here at this time. We have now discovered our purpose. The God decided he was going to give the king a dream. And by the way, this dream, I don't have time to talk about it today. This dream, if we understand this dream of the king, you will understand the book of Revelation. Because it's a dream that talks about the kingdoms that will come and Jesus, the final kingdom, destroying all the other kingdoms. The final kingdom of Jesus destroys all the other kingdoms because he is the untouchable king. That's what he reveals to Daniel. So Daniel goes to the king and he, very quickly, verse 24, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king and I will interpret the dream for him. Ariok took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what the king dreamed. Verse 26, king, the king asked Daniel, also called Bethshazzar. It's interesting that when he goes to the king, they try to call him the name of the gods of, of Babylon. Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream? Look at Daniel's reply in verse 27. You, you, you don't reply like this. Daniel verse 27 says, King, he starts with the word no. No wise man, enchanter, or magician can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. Like, even me, I can't. Now let me tell you this, King. I couldn't. That's why I had to talk to someone else. That there is someone else who does all of these things. But there is a God, verse 28, in heaven. There is a God in heaven. There is a God who is higher than all these other gods. There is a God in heaven. He is telling the king who thinks he is God that there is, a, there is someone who is higher than him who is able to do this. And then he goes on and he tells the king his dream. Like I said, I won't go into that. Verse 48, let's Let's go to verse 40, 45. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron and the bronze and the clay and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then verse 46 the king Nebuchadnezzar, the one who, feel, who thought he is very strong, who is God, what did he do? He fell prostrate before a 17-year-old, before an Israelite, before a Jew. I mean, think of that. King Nebuchadnezzar never bowed down to anybody. But right now he's just seen God. Could it be that your purpose is to reveal God in your home, at work, through that cancer, through that situation, that that is your purpose, through that dark circumstance, that your purpose is to reveal God of heaven and see the people around you bow down, literally bow down and say, even in this difficult situation, we have seen God. We have seen Jesus. He's high and lifted up. That is the highest purpose for you and me. To reveal God. When we are convinced that God is God, and we press into a crisis, not run away from it, And pray to God. He does reveal himself. Through mortal bodies. Young, ordinary men that die. Simple people like Noel. He can heal. Could it be that that's your highest purpose? You're asking the question, God, why am I here? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here 
to reveal God. The fear that New Jersey would know who God is. You are in this place at this time, right now, that people may know that there is a God in heaven who is above all the gods of this culture. Let's give him praise. Bridgewater, give him praise. Bridgewater, lift him up. Ha! Amen. Let me just pray for us right now. We thank you that you are the king of kings. You're the prince of peace. You're the lord of lords. I'm praying for everyone here today that they will know that you are God. Anyone who is going through a situation today, Father, give them the courage, the courage to push into that crisis. Courage, Father. And I pray, Father, that you will show up from heaven and show off your name. This I ask in Jesus' name.